name is Bob Bradley. I'm the product line manager for security solutions at uh, Sonus Networks. IP, by definition, is open. It's easier, all the nice reasons why you're here, why the VPF exists, and by definition, is also vulnerable. Now, tied to that, uh, and this comes a little bit from the data world, that IP voice security best practices are a key component of next generation design. And the reason that we say that is that, and I'm going to do a quick jump to something I want to show, show you. Some of you may spend time reading documents like this. This happens to come from Etsy. And, and there are volumes and volumes of, of standards that describe the different components of IMS or TiSpan networks, but they don't address everything you need. So subsequently, you can read this and you get the good basics, but there are things that we've learned by pr actual implementations of protecting networks, both edges and the cores, that in fact that, that the standards do not address. So this, this is an FYI. So. Now, as far as this next bullet, we're talking about the integrity, uh, and, and these are mandatory work items. And it's not just, you know, Eric and Tom and Bob that say this. Uh, this is pretty standard. Uh, first off, I don't, how many of you are familiar uh, with, in that second sub-bullet, the industry, sorry, what is called the VoIP Security Alliance? Have any of you ever heard of that at all? No? Okay, the VoIP Security Alliance, or VoIPs, that was founded about, about two years ago, and it's a consortium of vendors and carriers uh, that work working together to uh, define not only the best practices around how do you protect IP voice networks, but also setting up uh, like a, a threat model. I mean, the things you have to worry about, like toll fraud and, and denial of service and how do you deal with that, and then defining de detailed requirements on individual products uh, in order to be able to protect the network. So the VoIP Security Alliance, voipsa.org, very good site. I would encourage you to go there. A lot of good reading. It's free. Uh, other uh, more formal standards bodies, such as ISOs 27001, where it talks about the secureness of the IT network, all have influence and direct pertinence to IP-based voice networks. And then vendors such as like IBM ISS and VoIP vendors such as ourselves, you know, Sonus, and then finally carriers such as like Tom represents for XO. So it, it's not just, um, you know, either a, a fear of God thing or that Armageddon hasn't occurred yet. Uh, there are some practical guidelines and across all the, from the pure market to the pure deployment. Uh, for those of you who don't have 2010 reading uh, vision, uh, these two articles I happened to pick recently. The one on the on your right actually was from last year about a particular individual who got sent to jail after hacking through an enterprise router and was selling millions and millions of uh, wholesale minutes and never got caught until somebody happened to notice there was a lot of calls being made and not too many CDRs to match, so that kind of gave it away. Um, and then in the, in the other article, which is from Light Reading, they're talking about that SIP does have some basic uh, security vulnerabilities. Once again, uh, don't have to have a panic attack. There are things you can do about it, just like any protocol, like HTTP for the web or SNTP for email. But they're saying that the, the uh, VoIP security crisis is coming because think beyond voice. Think SIP is a basic protocol for you know, IM, for presence, uh, soft clients, a lot of the phones you have, you know, may have at some point embedded SIP clients to do things be beyond a simple phone call. And subsequently, they have to be hardened and they have to be uh, made such that they can be uh, protected as well as functional. Now, to date, SBCs, as we know and love them, as they were introduced in the early 2000s, has been the primary focus on protecting the edge, and you absolutely need these things, okay, in the sense of that, and we'll talk about the functions in a minute. Drivers for next gen, let's say, once again, are the standards activities, both for the IP uh, multimedia subsystem and for tie span, but it's not enough. And so subsequently, you're getting to where the solution that you do ultimately need is you need something beyond the edge. I can tell you for a fact that um, we see, as, as many of the, the vendors do, uh, requests for proposals, RFPs from folks like you. Uh, worldwide, from tier ones, you know, down to the smallest, you know, Caribbean telecom. And not only do they usually have a section in there regard that discusses what are your software, uh, session border controller functions. Do you do this? Do you do transcoding? Th that's kind of standard. That's table stakes. But what you also find in there is they have a separate security section. They want to know, okay, all the other elements in the network. 
uh, the media server, your provisioning, uh, your feature server, um, class five replacement, whatever, how do they protect themselves? How are they hardened? How do they maintain their integrity uh, in, inside the core? So once again, ultimately what you need is having a, a session border element on the edge is not sufficient. Now, typical functions, once again, if you attended uh, in the past some of the uh, good sessions here at the VPF on SBCs, this is the standard shopping list. Uh, providing topology hiding so people can't see your inside addressing schemes as a back-to-back -back user agent. Maintaining session control, uh, also a call admission control based on either bursts or how do you handle emergency calls when you're going through a registration avalanche from a number of IADs. And these are the type of things, you, you still need these, these don't go away. This, what we're promoting is that what goes beyond that um, what, what is it needed in addition to? Now, this diagram here on this next slide uh, in the, shows on the, on the left, you have kind of the basic building blocks inside of a session border controller and where you've got the back-to-back -back user agent. Once again, it's providing the topology height in the session manager. The thing that drives it, which is typically a local policy, and then media relay in order to be able to get the RTP streams uh, between the endpoints. And on the right-hand side, if you're into acronyms, are there the appropriate uh, IMS or TIESPAN entities that those functions have been uh, broken out into. So for instance, in the case of uh, for signaling, managing signaling in the peering environment, like a VPF type topology, where you have what they call the IBCF, the Internet Interconnect Border Control Function. That is a purely a signaling gateway that once again performs many of the functions, but not everything that's in a traditional SBC versus at the bottom, the BGF, the border gateway function, that is your media relay. Uh, the, the real meat in next gen networks is managing the media. And so subsequently, there is a separate entity defined by the standards to do that. And if you go back to a document like I showed you earlier, the title page from Etsy, you'll find all sorts of good information on what all these are. They're like the resource admission and control subsystem racks, that's basically your centralized policy. And the proxy CCF, that performs the signaling gateway function, if you will, in an access environment or consumer facing versus the IBCF. So the alphabet soup just says there are things that perform some functions, but then again, it's, it's insufficient, it's not enough. This is kind of the list you'll see, policing uh, both signaling traffic and media, uh, call admission control, dealing with rogue RTP so people don't try to steal phone calls. This, this, this is all good, and this is addressed by the standards. However, so what else is needed? Uh, and this is the premise of, of our discussion today. First, the first deliverable is, is a holistic security policy that reflects the goals of the organization. Uh, Technology is nice. Uh, you can kick the tires all you want. But uh, you basically have to still, what is, what is my business uh, I'm in? What is the business I want to achieve? And what is the risk associated by using a flexible platform such as IP in order to be able to do that, whatever it happens to be? So risk, risk mitigation. And as it points out here, it's not just technology risk but also against people. For instance, uh, someone that comes into your network, coming into your NOC with an affected laptop uh, with, with a worm or a virus, they may not be malicious, they may not know they've done it, but they're behind your firewall, and unless you have certain protections such as network admission control to keep that, uh, that laptop, infected laptop, from connecting to your network, you're gonna, at worst case, you know, you may have file damage or data destruction. Uh, best case, quote unquote, uh, it may be just something that consumes uh, bandwidth and just slows down uh, your network uh, performance. Augment border protection with defense and death. I'm gonna defer a lot of this uh, to, my, to my colleague, Eric, but fixing up the core network, protecting the integrity of the signaling layers as they be using things like IPsec or, or the transport layer security, or TLS. Hardening of all the individual elements, uh, turning things off you don't need, shutting ports down. Once again, this is pretty standard in best practices. Authentication, everything from simple passwords to uh, two-factor authentication to the other extreme, making use of uh, what they refer to as a federated identity, which is kind of like a passport and digital certificates. And then proper logging of uh, not just general activities, but security events. So there are solutions in closing, as I, I pass the baton to my colleagues, that do exist in the industry that mitigate not only the problems at the edge, but, in the, but also within the core to provide what is referred to as a defense in depth uh, uh, architecture.